case you miss anything or you have to sign off early, hopefully not too many times, you won't do that. But if you do, you can catch those uh, lectures or that part of a lecture on YouTube uh, and I sent, again, my daughter helped me with this. <laughs> I couldn't have done this. I hope people saw a link, did you? Uh, which my daughter forwarded, it looked like it went through to all of my students in this class, which was for my channel on YouTube. It's pretty simple. It's Mark Wilson's SRJC Art History Lectures. And then you'll see all the lectures and the dates and the topics. Uh, it'll be clear which one you wanna log on to. <clears throat> the newest ones are at the front. So if you just miss something in a week or two, you, you know, after that, it will be near the beginning or the front of that set of videos. Can I ask anybody to get that link? You did, thank you. That's very helpful to hear, thank you. Now, I've made I, uh, one more announcement, and this is a, a, a really nice uh, a bit of uh, upscale or upbeat, I should say, not upscale, um, <clears throat> input from you, all of you. Um, I got almost everybody's mini bios. I did not have time getting ready to learn how to get up to speed to do this from the campus because it's not the same as when you do it at home. I've been doing that for two semesters on Zoom, I mean. <clears throat> so the point is I didn't have time to read too many of them. The few I've read very well, you know, focused and, and, and informational. And I think it's gonna be helpful for me, but it also is how I call, uh, I mean, I log you guys in and uh, know who is really in the class. So uh, one more time, if you didn't already, hmm, uh, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, my daughter did this. Um, I'll ask you to reset. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, by, by the way, someone from the Tuesday night class said they would send it to everybody, but I didn't want to depend on that. It's not up to students to do that. It's helpful, very helpful when they choose to. Uh, but uh, I did, uh, have my daughter sit down and I watched what she was doing. So it should have gone through a pair. Did it go through to yours? Uh, uh, let's see, Dianara. I don't know if you're here. I assume you are because you just said, yeah. Okay, so at least some people could get it. I don't know why not everybody did. It should have gone into your student, you know, email cubbies or whatever <laughs> they call your, your student in your student portal. Okay, uh, so let's move on to the, the lecture topics. But before we do that, uh, the last thing I'll mention is that those, uh, I'm going to remind you, if you either just joined because you weren't here on Monday, uh, right, uh, or you've just been too busy, if you can get them all into me by Friday, that would be helpful. But just as a backup, I will mention whom I haven't gotten them from because that's not like any kind of, uh, you know, privileged information. It just helps me to remind a few people who I understand life gets crazy these days. So if you forgot somehow or you did it and you forgot to send it or you maybe you sent it to the wrong email. There, M. Wilson is an actual different person than me and I get some things from whoever that guy is. I think he's on the East Coast. So you know it's markw at aol.com is the email to send all assignments and extra credit and of course your mini bios too. Okay, so all I'm saying is that, that, that if you didn't think to do it by Friday, you'll get an email to remind you of that. And I will say it one more time and not keep repeating it in class because I have until the third week to uh, submit the list of no-show drops are called. And that's when I double check that I'm not dropping anybody who sent me their bio. So you do need to do that if you didn't. All right, last uh, call for anybody who has a question. We have uh you just join us. Yes, who, go ahead. Yeah, so on the syllabus, uh, it says on week two to read chapter 17 by Stockstad. I'm wondering, is do we have chapter seven? Or are we supposed to have chapter 17? Because for my book, it only goes, starts from 18 and up, so. Oh, well, early, okay, good question. For clarification sake for everyone, I'll probably try to remind myself tonight in my in-person class to say this. It is on your, uh, See, note number three, I missed a lot of stuff, I know, we're, and we're just starting. It down the third note on the first page, the exact number of this chat, you know, because they change the editions around to make people think they have to buy a new edition at the full price, right? It's a scam, textbook publishers. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, anyway, so in other words, what you need to read is the, the chapter that corresponds to the topic for next week, which is early Renaissance. Now, that might bring up a question. I don't know if the, whoever, I didn't see who it was that asked that question. Was it Paolo? Anyway. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, uh, that, uh, that why are we going back before 1500? 
I will tell you why, because people like Da Vinci is a classic example. His work spanned from the, you know, late 1400s, well into the 1500s. So if I was told, I, which I haven't yet been, that, oh, you can't show any slides from before 1500, I would have to literally cut his career in half and present only the latter half. It makes no sense. So the Renaissance begins about 1400 is the point in Italy. So I cover that, but I do also cut down. Don't worry, I've said this last week, but if, or sorry, on Monday. And I'll repeat it when we review for the final, uh, by uh, at least 30% uh, for the midterm and 50% of this list. Plus it's an open book test. So, But yes, you do need to figure out which chapter corresponds to the 1400s, which is the early Renaissance. And that would get you probably up through week two, right? Uh, in any case, yeah, you'll have to do a little bit of, uh, you know, assessment of your version or edition. You see what I'm saying? I couldn't possibly mm -hmm. track it. Some people have editions as low as long ago as 10 years, and I, I or even 12 years. Anything after 2008 in stocks that is acceptable. Okay. okay. Now I'm giving you the, the the chance to buy the least. I hope it helps you. Least expensive used copy off Amazon or whatever, because there are not that many changes. But the numbers of the chapters did, and you know why they did that. So they would think that professors would force their students to buy the new edition. I don't mm -hmm. believe that's fair, right? So, but it's a good question. I'm glad you asked that and clarify. Okay, any other questions before we start? Because we've kind of got to get to our first slide now. Okay, let's hope this works. Yay, there it is. All right, uh, I'm gonna hide the thumbnail here and I will tell you in just a minute, as soon as I get this full screen, First of all, can everybody see this? You should be able to. It says, I am screen sharing. Anybody? <laughs> this is the Libyan Sybil. Nobody? Okay. Just one person needs to say yes. Yeah, I can yes. see it. Thank you. Yeah, we can I understand. You're more likely rather just not want to have to speak up unless it's urgent for your, your own question. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I only do that because when I first started doing Zoom, uh, what is that, three semesters ago, there were times when, for whatever reason, people couldn't see the uh, pictures. But I think that uh, that glitch has been solved. Okay, here we go. Here's how you're going to start. You should be taking all your notes for this semester. It's pretty simple. I keep it just to the you know salient points. Divide the notes for each slide that's on the syllabus as you're about to take them into two categories. You'll find why this is really helpful for also for writing your papers too, in case you choose to write about a work of art from the syllabus, you can. But remember for your papers, we're, that's six, you know, five, six weeks from now. We'll talk about it in detail uh, about two weeks from now. But just as a heads up, you can write about any work of art you want to write about from any period. Doesn't have to be a famous artist or a period covered by this class. Okay, but you do have to find research and we'll talk about that sources for the research. So if you pick graffiti off of a, uh, you know, a freeway overpass, it might be hard to write about that one. But sometimes you can find uh, research on, on uh, street art too. Okay, so the point is that this is a must know. That's my shorthand term. And you'll hear me say that throughout. That means cue up the notepad or whatever you're writing on the paper uh, or the recording device, because you want to get the notes in, uh, divided into two categories. I always start with meaning. And we'll get to that in just a moment for this and the other three slides today, the meaning of the work of art. So maybe you just want to you know, put it in caps or underline it as a heading or subheading. Then I'll give you the title. Even though it's on the syllabus, I will say it once and spell it once slowly. But I don't want to have to keep repeating it for obvious reasons. We wouldn't never get through this uh, semester if I had to repeat everything several times. So you should have them on your syllabus. But I'll always say the title and uh, the artist's last name and the date. And then the second category, when I finish with the meaning, which should be about a paragraph or maybe a little more, depending on uh, you know how you write things down. Uh, the second half is two words, formal analysis. And that means the composition. How did the artist create the images that we're looking at? Whether it's a building, that applies to any work of art, visual, visual work of art, painting, sculpture. I mentioned this last week. These are the five categories that qualify. Uh, painting, sculpture, uh, architecture, drawing, and photography. Okay, so you should already now have done this. Put down meaning, 
as the first slide for the heading for the first slide notes. Okay, the title of this slide is Libyan Civil. That's L-I-B-Y-A-N, two words. Civil is S-I-B-Y-L. The artist's name, Michelangelo. And in case you haven't written that name recently, I'll spell it. M-I-C-H-E-L-A-N-G-E-L-O. Michelangelo and the date is 1512. So the other handout that I've told you a few times has to be uh, in front of you before every lecture because each lecture you all get, uh, I keep it to just three or four. And today it's only gonna be two. New terms. So it's a list of terms to know for art 1.2. So uh, the first one is fresco. So let me give that to you. So uh, you see on the handout, I hope you've all read this, the instructions, but I'm telling you the way to do this is to, here we go, is to write a beneath the word print or whatever, you know, and then you got a list of definitions that you'll have to, to use during the exams, right? Or for your papers. Okay. So the first definition, very easy. Fresco is a painting on wet plaster. I'll say it again one more time. A fresco is, just one sentence, a fresco is a painting on wet plaster, period. That's what we're looking at. So here we go with the meaning. This is a fresco. So now you know what that means. A painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. That's S-I-S-T-I-N-E. -S -S -E. But you don't have to worry about the spelling of any words that aren't on the syllabus. For the test, you do have to get the words from the syllabus, like the artist's name and the title, right? But you'll have the notes, remember, in front of you. Okay, so this is in a uh, chapel. You can just say a chapel. It's good enough. In Rome. Uh, he painted, some of you know this, right? M many panels on the ceiling. The exact number, well, I'll tell you, because this is one of 18 panels. He painted 18 different sets of scenes from the Bible. They're scenes from the Bible that he was ordered to paint by the Pope. And I do mean ordered. He was not given a choice. The Pope literally uh, sent soldiers to him to uh, force him to return. He walked off the job at one point. Now you don't have to write that's a sidebar, but it's interesting to know he wasn't being paid and he was getting sick because he was breathing from the ceiling lying, you know, this upside down. So you might want to write just how did he do it? He, he uh, lay, laid down, is that correct? <laughs> was lying on his back on scaffolding 60 feet above the floor. One time he almost fell and killed himself. Very dangerous job. And he got sick and tired of it because he wasn't even being paid by the Pope, right? But the Pope said, I'll pay you when you're done or something. So he left, he walked off the job and the Pope sent soldiers to, uh, to go force him to come back. That's a well-documented incident. Okay, but the other part of the meaning is, who is this figure? A Sibyl is a kind of angel. And I'm being very simplistic. It's a little more complex, but let's keep it simple. A, a type, you could say, or, or a kind of angel. And she's up in heaven. This is what Michelangelo's scene that he's showing us from the Bible is about. It's the other part of the meaning that you definitely, if it's on the exam, you'd want to have this in your notes, of course. So she is looking down to earth to answer a question that she got from someone on earth, because that's her job. She's assigned by God, the Sibyls, there were many of them. And this is one of them called the Libyan, of course, Sybil. And so, so her job is to answer people's questions uh, if God tells her to. In other words, if they were worthy of getting an answer from God. He would tell her, go ahead and answer the question. And just as another sidebar, you don't have to write this. But what kind of questions? Life or death questions, not what's the winning lottery number tomorrow. It, you wouldn't get an answer from, from through the Sybil from God on that, right? At least not that I ever heard of, it's not in the Bible. The point is what kind of questions, life or death, things like, you know, will I die in battle tomorrow? Or will my uh, son or daughter recover from their illness? Or will I be happy if I marry this person? That kind of question. And she's about to answer one of them. So that's pretty much the whole thing, except for this little creature. So let's put the cursor here, you see there, the little uh, baby angel. So that's your only other term for today. There's just two for this first lecture. Cherub. Some people say it cherub with a hard ch. It's the second one down on the list of terms to know. So it's also very short. Cherub is a 
baby angel often found in Renaissance art. And don't worry about the spelling of the word Renaissance. So it's right there on your, <laughs> if you want to get it correct on, you know, right, the next term down. Uh, but we'll get to that uh, next week, uh, that definition, because that's a little longer. Okay, I'll repeat it one more time. The second definition uh, for today is cherub, and that is a baby angel often found in Renaissance art. Well, that's a cherub there. What's he doing? Nothing. He's not helping her. That's his, supposed to be her assistant, you know, her, her sidekick, however you want to put that. Uh, and he's, it looks like he's looking at himself reflected in this smooth marble, which marble does reflect. If it's really high quality marble, you can see yourself in it. But we don't know that. All we know is Michelangelo's having a little humorous side note here by putting this Sybil uh, working hard to lift this big book. It's called the Book of Prophecies if you want to write that. But you can just say, to tell the future to someone on earth, she has to lift up this book. And she's getting no help from her sidekick. <laughs> So that's almost the entire meaning with one last fact that might be something a better few of you already know about Michelangelo himself. Do you notice how realistic the body is on this figure, her muscles, right? All the way from her back, up her arms, her neck, and then the clothing, right? But also the way uh, her body, you know, looks like it's in motion and it's realistic. And so are the, uh, the skin tones and the muscles on the baby angel. So how did he know, does anybody know, how did Michelangelo learn when he was a young art student, how to paint the human body so realistically? Anybody know, or have you heard? Okay. Um, did he do a dissecting or? Yeah, yeah absolutely, you got it. Yes, he, he did, it was illegal, he could have been arrested for it. Um, da Vinci got permission because he, he said he was doing it after he was already famous for one thing, and second, he was doing it as a scientific experiment. But what uh, uh, Michelangelo was doing is just to know how the human body looks in different positions and how muscles attach to the bones, right? And uh, the joints, you know, look at different, but he, he just experimented with, if you're curious what kind of bodies, you don't have to write this, but they would have been uh, what today would sadly be, you know, homeless people, you might say, or otherwise they call them paupers, and meaning people who had no family, that they were just going to be buried in an unmarked grave. So he would then pay the you know, cemetery to take those bodies and, and dissect them and then take them away again. So he wasn't a ghoul. There was nothing strange about it. A lot of our art students did that, but it was against the law. So he was, he was taking a risk, but you can see the effect it had that taught him how to paint more realistically than anyone before him, the human body. So now that's a lot more of meaning than you'll have to write on, depending on how much of it you wrote on the uh, midterm, if this is on the midterm. Uh, all I require is a paragraph, uh, six sentences or more, if you want to, and you'll have your notes in front of you to do that. Okay, so now let's do the other half of the notes, which is under the, the second heading you should have already labeled, uh, which is formal analysis. That's the composition. We're going to start slow. So let's just talk about two or three things on each of these slides today. Later on, I'll give you six or maybe all nine. There are nine elements of composition. We're going to cover those in detail next week. And that'll be from my home because I have a whiteboard with them all drawn or, or described or illustrated on the whiteboard. And you'll, you'll be clear by the end of next week how to, those um, techniques are used. But it's a little early now. So let's just cut it to a couple of things. Let's start with her pose. Again, there's no right or wrong here. What does anybody notice something unusual about, or how would you describe her pose? Let's put it that way. Is she just sitting straight upright and looking straight at us like most portraits would be? No. Nope. So how would you describe that um, position of her body? It kind of looks like she's sitting or at least getting up from sitting. In motion. Is that what you're implying? Because that's yeah, that's the, the the goal the artist has, and that that you you'll want to mention in your notes. Yeah, she's in in motion or in movement. But she, well, no one said the word twisted <laughs> or right uh, turning. Any of those words will do in your notes. There's no right or wrong way for some of these things. Some some definitions are, are you know pretty specific, but this is just trying to get you to look at the way a composition of a, of, in this case, a painting, uh, you know, gets across the meaning. She is in motion. So you, you, you're basically on the right track, that, that last comment. She's in the middle of picking up a book and he had to turn to do that. So she's literally twisting 
or turning her body. That's not typical for portraits of, of anything, biblical or human figures, you know? Uh, so he did that to create a quality, here we go, the first element you should have in your notes today for this slide about composition, it, it's dynamic, it's the phrase. And I'll tell you now what that means and next week we'll, we'll go over it in more detail. Anything, any work, sorry, any work of art any, or part of any work of art that has two or more diagonal or curved lines is dynamic. And dynamic is a way of saying in motion or feels like it has some movement. So what about this? Is almost the entire painting is dynamic. Are there any straight lines? Because what is the opposite of dynamic? A single composition encompasses either whether a painting or a building or a sculpture, whatever it is, is either mostly or all dynamic mostly stable or a mixture. This is almost entirely dynamic. Look at all, there's diagonal lines on the book, right, covers and pages, and then her whole body, there's not a straight line in it. Not really, because even, even this calf is curved, right, and her toes, right? Uh, and the baby angel, right, is, uh, uh, or it's, I don't know if it has a gender, uh, the sheriff, it's the sheriff's body is, is, is dynamic. The only thing stable are the edges of the wall behind them the top, maybe, you know, the, the various little decorative patterns. And maybe this wooden box, yeah, that that down there with the largest toe in the history of art, somebody said in one of my class, five pound toe that she's resting on that box. So the box is stable and the corners or edges of the wall behind, that's it. Everything else has got curved and diagonal lines. So you would write it this way if it's on the test. This painting is almost entirely dynamic. And then I already told you why, because the figures are all, you know, and you'd say, well, you know, they're curved. And where? Well, on the arms, on the hips, on the legs, on the feet, uh, you know, everywhere. There, there are no, yeah, it would be stable if the figures were standing ramrod straight upright with their arms down to their side looking straight at us. And you don't see that very often except in formal portraits. So this is a dynamic composition. Another thing is what about the, uh, what color do you notice first? Which object, I should say to your notes, I almost gave away the second element of composition I was going to tell you to write in your notes. So Something, what, color or gold? Yeah, yeah. I, I think of it as a kind of a yellowish orange, or you could say gold. See, that's where it's up to you to describe the specific tonal quality. But clearly the dress, right, is what most people will notice first. And there's a reason for that. So this is the second of the uh, formal elements to add to your notes about this slide today, that uh, there are two types of, well, no, actually three, but all oh, we're gonna keep it simple today. There are two major okay. categories of colors, either warm tones, which is earth tones is the other phrase for that. Uh, either, either phrase is acceptable. But if you were writing about it, you'd say, this has uh, warm or earth tones on her, dress and her skin and her hair as well as on the baby angel's skin and hair because those are some people say bright that's not correct so don't use that word that's too nebulous warm tones are there's a specific set of them and i don't want to you know overwhelm you at the start of the semester but next week we'll have time to go over them in, in more detail but but orange or uh, gold or yellow or pink, like her undergarment here, it looks like, and her skin. Those are all warm tones. And that's because the artist wants you to notice her body first. You know, the dress she's wearing and the pose she's in and her arms and her muscles and the uh, sidekick or baby angel next to her. Then what's the opposite of warm colors? Cool colors. Cool colors are very short list. They are white gray, green, and blue. And so the background behind these two figures is entirely cool in this picture, depending on, of course, what kind of screen you have. Sometimes it makes things look a little yellowish when they aren't. It's all gray. I've, I've, anybody here been to the Sistine Chapel, by the way? Anybody? Uh, I you? have. Oh, okay. When were you there? Oh, God, it's gotta be about 15 years ago. They were in the process of restoring it still. Oh, they were still, because when I went in 2000, they said they had just finished restoring it, but obviously that's not quite correct. Well, how well they, they, they let us in, but uh, they still had some construction stuff around it. But the ceiling was visible, was it? Uh, yes, it was. And it's pretty impressive, isn't it? Once you know what uh, Very doing. impressive. Yeah, I bet you guys- They always say, if you, go in, if you go into the Vatican, that's the first thing you do is just go straight yeah. to the Sistine yeah. Chapel. 
at some point, if you uh, any of the, the rest of you ever get to Rome, uh, two things. There's almost no trees. <laughs> There's a few places where there are trees. So you be prepared to be hot <laughs> if you go in the summer anyway. And uh, you know, dress accordingly, prepare for that. But the other is, yeah, I agree. You should probably go first to, well, most people go to the Colosseum first, okay? Whichever you prefer, but don't forget when you go to the Vatican, you're gonna wanna spend, how long were you allowed to spend in there? And then we're gonna move on to the next slide. I wanna say 20 minutes oh, was what yeah. they were giving yeah, I us guess 20 they minutes long. I think they've shortened it. Yeah, and I'm not talking about during the pandemic. Obviously, that's changed everything. But they still are allowing people to go in if they if they pr have proof of vaccination now, but less people than they used to. Yeah, when I went, it was super crowded, super hot, and they let you stay as long as you want until after a while, if the room got really too crowded, they would begin to gently move you back towards the exits, you know. But I was able to stay 45 minutes, and I had, you know, a, a camera, and they let me take with no flash a telephoto lens, uh, some of the ceiling. Uh, photos. Okay, we need to move on. So I'll say one more thing. Uh, and this I'll just tell you because we want to pick up the face here. See under her arm or it's all around the arm and over the shoulder, her neck and even her face. And the same with the arms of, uh, and body of the baby angel. There is a bowl. So this is the third technique of comp formal comp elements of composition. So formal analysis again is, is the heading so what is uh, the the last one we'll say and we'll move on to the next slide it's it's called line here the line is bold just two words outlines around the main figures not so much around the background it's less so here right on these plastered figures but on the the uh, living figures right you can say or the two main figures the michelangelo did that all the time with his he wanted you to notice those figures that's why he used them before you would see anything else around them. So he used warm colors and bold outlines on almost all of his paintings when he wants to emphasize a particular figure. Okay, let's move on now. Now this is controversial for reasons that might be self-evident. You might immediately think, oh, well, it's obvious why, but I think you'll be surprised. There were two scandals separate that this painting created in Paris when it was exhibited. Okay, so this is our next, must not, second one from tonight's list, or today's, sorry. I'm used to teaching at night. Okay, Luncheon on the Grass. Uh, you probably already know Luncheon, L-U-N-C-H-E-O-N. Luncheon on the Grass. The artist's name is Manet, that's M-A-N-E-T. Not Monet, don't mix them up, because you'll see we'll, we'll, we'll cover Monet and Manet both. They lived at the same time and they were both impressionists. So why am I, oh, I didn't give you the date, sorry, 1863. <clears throat> I don't know why, it's right in the middle of our civil war for what that's worth, don't write that, but it gives you some context maybe. But in Europe, they weren't having any civil wars, not yet, they did later, but not yet. So, uh, and before that. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a pre, I think the right word is a precursor, or you can say a prototype, either word is fine precursor or prototype of an impressionist style painting. And we don't now have time to go into, it's not on your definition list, but when you get to impressionism, you'll get the definition of it. I think a lot of people, and this is my main point for why I bring this up now with this slide, have a false impression that anything that's fuzzy is impressionist. Any painting that's not sharp, clear, and realistic, it's much more um, specific than that. So. The only thing about this painting that should be obvious besides the controversy over her nudity, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, how it happened and what, what the reaction was. But first we're gonna say, why does this have an area up above that's not as sharp? Let's get up close and you'll see what I mean. See these three figures, including the painter and one of his friends, whoops, I didn't need to make it move around there. And this woman was a friend of the painters and actually an art, uh, what's the word, patron of the art, she was wealthy. I'll go ahead and tell you, she chose to be in the painting and she suggested, according to just say many historians, there's research, it's hard to know because no one interviewed her about it that I know of, but she must have had some conversations with people where she said, oh, I wanted to be in the painting and I suggested to be new because I wanted to get attention to this wonderfully new idea of these wonderfully advanced or you know innovative artists, my friends, they were her friends and the artist himself, right here with the beard, well, they both have beards, <laughs> without the hat, uh, is uh, Monet. 
And the guy leaning back is somebody else you don't need to know, but I'll tell you who it is. You may have heard of him, Pissarro, P-I-S-S-A-R-O, if you want to write. Just say it's two of the early Impressionists, but the man who painted it, Manet, is the one closer to the woman. And it, so it was her idea to be uh, posing that way. Guess what? Do you think they did this outdoors? Oh, even in a liberal city like Paris in the 1800s, she'd, they'd all been arrested. No, they didn't go to a park and she didn't sit there like this. It was done in her, his studio. And then he superimposed the figures, or at least her figure, uh, onto the you know scene. But the other scandal, of course, that calls a scandal. People saying, "Oh my goodness, did you actually sit out in the open in a park in Paris and do this?" No, it was just a, an illusion that she probably that uh, model. Well, she's not a model because that wasn't a profession. She was a patron of, of these young artists. But the other controversy is the whole upper half of the painting. I think you kind of have to go. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Do you notice how it's not as sharp as the rest of the painting, but the only parts that are maybe her, her head and her arm, but look at her robes, look at the, um, the shore of this pond, the boat, the trees, the grass, it, it, it's very indistinct. Now there you might say, oh, it doesn't that mean that it's fuzzy and if it's fuzzy, it's impressive. No, he's experimenting here and he's getting, Manet is getting to the point where eventually within three years, or just say a few years, if you keep it simple, he, he came up with the, one of the first Impressionist paintings in the world. He was experimenting with this by making the upper half less realistic than the usual painting. Almost every other painting by every other painter up until that time had been super sharp and realistic as they were taught to do. And some of you have taken art classes, I can see from your mini bios. So you know what I'm talking about. You, usually you start out learning realistic techniques of you know perspective, right? And uh, sharp, realistic detailing. And then maybe you experiment. At least that's how art was taught. Then. He experimented on his own. No one taught him this or suggested it. So he decided to make the upper half of this painting, or at least most of it, except maybe, again, her arm and her, her face, uh, a, a less realistic. And that's moving away from realism towards the next style that came, that he helped invent. In fact, he was nicknamed the painter, you should put this in your notes, the father of Impressionism by the other Impressionists. He didn't tell anyone that he thought he was that, he didn't claim to be that, and he certainly didn't have the press claim him. The press hated the Impressionists. If you can believe it, they were considered beasts, they were called, I'm not kidding, they were considered uh, insulting the public's good taste. How dare you show an unfinished painting where the upper half isn't completely realistic? That's the kind of scandal that got more attention than the nudity, if you can believe it, of the one of the three figures. So this painting caused quite a sensation. And of course, it obviously did therefore get the attention of the art world. He was starving. Nah, I don't want to, that's overstated. He, he struggled. Uh, he was never wealthy. Money. He had trouble uh, getting his paintings accepted. Uh, I already explained why this one. But even after he became famous, and he did during his lifetime, he sold paintings. It wasn't like Van Gogh. He literally, Van Gogh was starving most of his uh, career as a painter, uh, barely, uh, you know, surviving. But but it wasn't that bad. But Manet had reject was reject. There we go. Manet's work, his all of his work, almost until very near the end of his life, uh, was rejected by mainstream critics, art galleries, and uh, collectors. The impressions were considered too radical. Now it sounds funny. I mean, it's. No, it's like 150 years ago, this was really revolutionary. Okay, so that's the whole meaning. Formal analysis. All right, we're going to talk about the fact that this part is, you can say fuzzy if you want. That's okay, because it's an accurate word to describe the, the effect here. And this is sharp. So that is called modeling or simulated texture. There's two things going on. And modeling is the use of light and dark, areas that contrast between light and dark. So for instance, on their faces. Not so much on her face, but you see here where the shadows around his nose and, and his eyes are, uh, right? And then uh, his, his hand, the other artist's hand, right? Um, and of course, the shadows around the edges of her body and, um, you know, on his pants. That's all contrast. Here we go. Modeling is one technique that's used very realistically in the bottom half because that part is traditionally realistic. So you just say it this way uh, in your notes. Uh, this artist used uh, realistic or sharp, you can use either word strong, sharp or realistic, uh, all three of those acceptable, modeling on the three human figures. But 
soft or diffuse, that's with a DI, not DE, <laughs> diffused or soft modeling on the upper part from the lagoon. Well, it's not really a lagoon, so it's a pond. From where the pond, the shore of the pond all the way to the horizon, that's diffused or soft modeling. The same is true for the textures, simulated textures, every work of art that isn't of um, actual you know, sculpture, but certainly every uh, you know, painting, photograph, drawing uses sim, that's S-I again, no T, simulated textures. Now, I know these are a lot of new terms. So the, uh, Sarah Gill's book, it's very helpful with this. Each one of these techniques has a separate chapter and she writes for an average, normal, educated audience, not, you know, technical jargon. That's why I chose her book. Uh, and uh, I think you'll find that it also helps you clarify. But next week, we're going to go over these in detail and take our time and I'll answer all your questions uh, on Monday. So make sure you, you attend that lecture if you possibly can. Okay, so textures can be simulated in a painting. They always are, right? I mean, the whole point is they're imitating reality. So there are simulated realistic, again, you can say sharp, strong, or realistic simulated textures on the clothing, right? The hair, the skin, and even let's uh, go back here on the picnic basket and the food and also on the trees in the front half. You see that on the tree trunks and the, of course, the whole tree, right? With the lily, all of that's done sharp and realistic, both the modeling, because the trunks have modeling. You can see that here, right? darker here, lighter there. So this uses two techniques for realistic painting in the bottom half, and then it doesn't use simulated textures here, except maybe on, again, her hair and, and uh, face and arm. But uh, otherwise, it's just soft and diffused. You could say that, but uh, unrealistic is okay, too. Uh, there is no real simulated texture in the upper half of the painting, or at least most of it, because he did. he was trying to break through that you know, tradition of everything has to be super realistic. It was, they were called uh, radicals, young Turks, revolutionaries by critics who didn't like their work uh, until about 20 years after they started, they, they became the impressions so uh, popular with the general public and, and wealthy collectors began liking their work that eventually, of course, they became mainstream. Okay. Uh, let's move on to, let's see, what's the, I don't have the time on my, oh, there it is. Yeah. We're doing really well on the time. But first, now, before we move on, I've, I've, I know this is several new terms that you wouldn't otherwise have heard unless you took another art history class uh, or you've read ahead in, in a Gill's book. Anybody have any questions about any of the first uh, uh, two slides or the techniques of composition that I've just mentioned? Yeah, it's a little early. So next, well, you will, I'm sure, have someone to do the... Uh, you know, my own diagram with, you know, a pointer and all that stuff. You'll see what I mean. It'll make it much clearer if it isn't already. And we'll go over all nine techniques because because on your papers, not in the exams, you only have to describe six of the techniques on each slide that are on the midterm and final. But on your papers to get an A, you need to describe all nine and I'll cover those next week. You'll get a handout. It'll be a PDF. You want to print it out and have it with you before class starts on Monday. Okay, no other questions right now? All right. Let's go to just another view of it. Picasso. This is a pretty famous painting. I bet some of you have seen images of it, or maybe you know it's on the wall of the United Nations in New York City. Uh, this is Guernica, G-U-E-R-N-I-C-A. One word. It's a town in Spain. Guernica. Picasso, you probably know, is, but I'll spell it if you haven't written it. Uh, it's P-I-C-A-S-S-O. We only use the last name of the artist in this class to make it easier. And the date is 1937. Okay, this has two different layers of meaning. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that on the exam, both the midterm and the final, you can just choose whatever six facts from, I probably give you twice that many, you know, maybe a half page to a page of notes, depending on how much you're writing. Only six of those facts, six sentences about six facts about each slide is what you have to write on the meaning part of your exams. And on your papers is a little different. We'll get to how to write the papers in a couple of weeks. Remember, they're not due till the sixth week. Okay, so the meaning here could be quite complex. So I'll just hit the highlights. Let's start with what is this scene? 
It's a scene from the Spanish Civil War. Picasso was Spanish. He wasn't living in Spain at the time, but you don't have to know that detail. He wasn't at this scene. He never saw this. But it was a, a, a um, war crime. There's no other word for it. This was a war crime. Uh, and it was the Germans, obviously the Nazis at this time, and the Italians who were you know, fascist. So you could just say the German and Italian fascist air force was helping the Spanish general who wanted to take over Spain. And you probably should write his name, Franco. He survived long after <laughs> Hitler and Mussolini were dead. Franco, he, he ruled Spain for over 40 years, F-R-A-N-C-O, was trying to take over Spain, you know, imit to imitate Hitler and his fascist regime in his own country. And the people who fought against him were, um, you know, uh, trying to defend democracy. So you can see why this got the world's attention. It was a civil war that lasted four years and it cost over a million lives. So this is one of the incidents in that civil war, a town, which you have the name, it's the title, in Northern Spain called Guernica was bombed for hours, I think a whole day on and off by German and Italian dive bombers. They killed well over a thousand people. Most historians think it was 1500 people. And so of course that got the world's attention and Picasso, though he wasn't living in Spain, if you wanna know he was in Paris at the time, he saw newsreels about it. He saw our newspaper and magazine articles, you know, there was photography of course. And he, being Spanish and being anti-fascist, like he was a communist, but anyway, he was opposed to the fascist, obviously. He became uh, morally outraged and decided he had to do something to help bring the world's attention. Because even though people knew about this war, they weren't really doing anything. And he felt they should help the side fighting for democracy. So he painted this with that goal in mind. And this is an example of art can sometimes influence history. This painting, which after he finished it, was on the cover of a whole bunch of magazines all around the world. He toured the world with this painting. It's huge. It's in Madrid. I doubt any of you have been to Madrid, right? It's a great city. It's in a museum in Madrid. It has a whole museum to just this painting and a few other Picasso paintings that are from that same period, because it's so important, this painting. It was chosen, a copy he made for the United Nations for the, that building, which, what is that, 1940 that opened? So it's been there for, what, 70 some years on the wall of the UN. That's a pretty important fact. Has to be pretty influential. So at the time, what influence did it have besides publicizing the, the, this terrorist act by the fascists? He was trying to get people to either uh, volunteer to fight the fascists because the, the side fighting for democracy was losing. Um, and they did lose in the end, of course, or donate money and both happened. Everywhere he went, people signed up and over 8,000 Americans volunteered to fight in Spain against the fascists. And one of them's name was Hemingway. You've heard of him, <laughs> right? The writer, he wouldn't have done that if he hadn't heard from Picasso's uh, you know, comments, maybe he didn't see the painting, I don't know, it doesn't matter. He was inspired by the the whole idea of Picasso to, in, you know, bring attention to this atrocity and to get people to try and help fight against the fascists. Sadly, it was too little too late, but that's a lot of people volunteering to fight in a foreign civil war, but they weren't fighting for money, they weren't mercenaries, they weren't paid, they went to fight it against the fascists. Uh, a year later, they, or no, two years later, Spain fell to the fascists, but in any case, it influenced a lot of people and, and also many more people than that gave money to the, you know, to, to help the fighters in Spain against the fascists. So this painting had an influence, direct influence on world history. The other thing is the style, the, the last part of the meaning, and this is much briefer about the meaning. This is called cubism. Now, I would have put that on the, the list of terms, but it's not part of the period we're covering but it is relevant to this slide. So here we go. Cubism is an early style, you know, like it sounds, I'll spell for you if, you, if you've never read it. C-U-B-I-S-M. Cubism is a style of abstract painting invented by Picasso. And I'll keep it simple. He just used repeated geometric shapes, the same shapes over and over in his paintings. Even a portrait of a single person could have a cubist style. He had other styles, you know, almost all great artists have multiple styles during their career, uh, but he's most famous for cubism. So what does that mean in this painting? Well, let's go up close to the bull. 
Anybody notice the shape you see repeated on the ear of the bull? Or how about the rays of light coming out of the street lamp? Or the tongue of this horse? What shapes are those? Right. Are you guys yeah, good? So, so, yeah, tri tri triangle, triangle. There's one of the repeated shapes, triangles. So you, should, you know, would write that in your notes, that this has what's called rhythm. I didn't give you the term. Now we're, we're switching to the, I apologize, I should have stopped and said, now under the second heading, I'll uh, re restate that. Okay, so under formal analysis, when it comes to the, the elements of composition, we haven't talked about this one as one of the other nine elements, uh, is repeated shapes. The use of repeated shapes in any work of art, it could be a building, a sculpture, or in this case, a painting, is called rhythm. I know in music, it's a whole different meaning, but this is in visual arts. Rhythm, right? I mean, you don't have to worry about the spelling, but if you want, I'll spell it, R-H-Y-T-H-M. Rhythm in a painting, you know, or sculpture or building, uh, it can be in a building, right? Or, or even a photo, is the use of repeated shapes in that work of art. There's lots of rhythm. That's what Cuba is all about. In fact, you see the oval is another shape. You see the eyes of all the living creatures well, these two, the oops, I misspoke. The horse's eyes aren't ovals, but but the uh, the human figures are. The mother with the dead baby, of course, that child's eyes are closed. And then you see the um, you know uh, oval in the street lamp here, right? And uh, at least part of the horse's head, right there. You see the side of the horse's head. Uh, and this dead soldier is supposed to be a soldier who used his tried to use his sword to fight dive bombers. Well, that's pathetic. You obviously just not gonna. He died. This is all from based on photos that Picasso saw of the aftermath of all the dead bodies lying in the street. So he actually saw images that inspired these figures. So a woman with a dead baby. I'm obviously emphasizing the human tragedy and loss here. So you see the oval is a repeated shape, mostly in the human be, uh, figure's eyes and the bowl. And then we have the, uh, you know, right triangle. But there's also the rectangles that are used. And those are mostly visible on the buildings, what there is of them, the, the, this you know, two-sided building that we see here, and then the doorway or when it's a window actually. Uh, so repeated shapes like in this case, three main ones again are triangles, right? Rectangles and ovals is typical of uh, the composition element of rhythm. And it's always in his paintings Picasso emphasized rhythm. Now the colors here are neither cool nor warm. It, I don't know how does it look to people on my computer, my laptop screen, it, they look kind of weird purplish blue, but the actual painting is, is off white and gray. In fact, maybe the next image, I think I have another image of it. Yeah, sorry, I forgot. This is more realistic. I, I don't know if it has that effect. In other words, there's no purple in that painting. It's it's called neutral when there is no bright or in other words, warm. I'm sorry, I should always say it that way. Warm or earth tones used. Obviously, there's no orange, red, pink, gold, yellow, none of that. And then even though white is used here, it's just only contrasted with black and white or gray, shades of gray, black, and white. And when that's the case, there's no warm colors contrasting in that painting or that uh, uh, you know, a work of art with a cool background or other cool colors. It's all called neutral. In other words, the use, I'll say it slowly again, that for future reference, I'll repeat it next week when we review these techniques, that there is a third category for color, that if there's no cool and warm in the same work of art, it's just white, black, and or shades of gray, that's called neutral because there's no warm or cool contrasts. He used neutral colors on this. And some people think that's strange. Why didn't he use the passionate colors of red? And I don't know why he just chose, I think he wanted you to look at the objects and not the colors of them and to see everything equally. Because if he used some warm colors, you wouldn't notice the other figures as soon. He wants you to look at the whole thing. This, this painting is about 20 feet long and it's reproduced on the wall of the UN at full, full length, by the way. And every time they have a debate on trying to end some, you know, crisis, the military, whatever, humanitarian, they have to walk past this painting, all of the representatives from each country, each, each uh, UN ambassador. So they see it every time they go to work. Um, okay, let's uh, do something else here about this. How about this? this? Here, look at where this cursor is and you see how I'm tracing a shape. Everybody knows what I'm getting at here, which is in the area where the light and dark. So there is modeling here, like on the horse's neck, especially. Uh, not a lot, very little, but there's some on the horse for sure, and maybe a little bit on the bull. 
Um, but the modeling is mostly from the background. And then in the middle where there's, well, uh, we're running short of time. So I'll just say it's, it's a large pyramid. You notice that the shape of all of the objects within these lines forms the overall shape, you know, of a rather loosely, you know, collected group of dead and dying bodies, which are all clumped together in the middle. And the only other objects are the two sets of, uh, you know, here's one animal and one mother, and then two people dying and burning buildings. So there's two figures on either side of this pyramid of dead and dying flesh, if you want to call their bodies, right? And those uh, bodies by definition are, this is now the only other for this slide and we'll move on to our last one. And then I'll stick around for several minutes answering any questions you might still have. Anyway, these figures were arranged carefully by Picasso for this effect. It's called balance in a composition when the objects in it are either roughly or very clearly arranged at even numbers or even sizes from left to right or top to bottom. We'll, I'll show you and I'll straight actually draw something on the board in real time next week when we do this thing with the whiteboard about this technique. And if it's not clear to don't worry yet because it will be by next week. But this is a balanced composition left to right because of what I said, it's arranged roughly the same number of figures and same area, the bull and the, die, the mother with the dying uh, or dead baby. And then the two figures running out of the burning buildings balance each other roughly from left to right as do the pyramid of dead bodies between them. But how about top to bottom? Oh, no, it's not balanced top to bottom because it's empty space up here, right? You see there's, you know, it's dark. It's supposed to be a street at night, right? And then down here is, is almost totally filled in with dead bodies, isn't it? So it's not balanced. The right way to say that is it is unbalanced toward the bottom, this painting. Uh, and, you know, but roughly and roughly or approximately is fine. You can just say mostly or, or roughly balanced left to right. Okay, that's an important uh, technique that you'll see in almost every work of art, even abstract paintings, whether they do or don't have balance is, is, is an easy thing that once you get the idea, but it's still early. So anyway, so let's move on to our last must know, which that's for another class. You know, did I? Uh, now I took this one off, but we're gonna cover, I'm gonna tell you about Van Gogh, but I think it's better not to launch in this late to, you know, things about him. It's so complicated complex but this one yes this could easily be on the exam because it's uh, the mo the world's most famous architect <laughs> at least he was during his lifetime so here are the last must know slide for today guggenheim that's g u g g e n h e i m museum two words guggenheim museum the artist's name is wright as you probably know frank lloyd wright all you have to know is his last name again that's spelled w r i GHT. And this is 1959 is the year. I'm going to start by asking anybody been to New York and been either driven, walked or driven past or even been to this museum? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So did you go inside? Yeah, I did. They had a they had a lot of artwork. It was really pretty. Oh, we yeah. Also have a, we also have a spiral. It's a spiral yeah, staircase yeah, yeah. that walks all the way Excellent. up. So it's Excellent. pretty impressive. Uh, thank you for bringing that up because I was going to mention Mr. Popper's Penguins is a movie that was <laughs> silly, corny little, of course, why would it be Jim Carrey? It's not going to be serious, right? Well, actually he has done some serious movies. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, that movie and another, maybe one or two of you have heard of or even seen, which is called The International with Naomi Watts and Clive Owen, two of my favorite British actors. Uh, well, she's actually Australian. Uh, the point is that they they play uh, detectives trying to, uh, you know, get evidence against a murderous, international, out of control, evil corporation. <laughs> Not an uncommon topic, but they have a shootout. It's a long scene inside this building. No, they had to recreate this building. No way these people who own the museum would let them shoot it up. This is an international landmark. At first, it was just a, a local New York City landmark. And uh, you already, thank you for bringing up the thing about the spiral and the other thing about the, the artwork. So what is the building? When you're writing about the meaning of a building, you should start with the purpose. This is a, not the Museum of Modern Art. There's several of them in New York, but a Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan, across the street 
from the Central Park. You know, Central Park is, of course, the biggest park, in, I think, in any big American city. So it's located, in other words, in one of the wealthiest sections of, of that city. And that's part of the meaning, because look at what's around it. Even in this close-up picture, you can see these are much older buildings. These are probably from the turn of the century, maybe 1910. The people that live in those buildings at the time that were in those buildings were already wealthy that far back. And they hated this building. It, before it got built, they saw, of course, the blueprints and the plan, uh, or I should say the uh, model. And then they were given a chance to look at, as is, you know, standard practice before building permits are issued. The city planning commission got, you know, a model from the architect that usually is how it happens, plus uh, the, the drawings and blueprints. And when people from that neighborhood came, they tried to stop it. They hated it. They said, it doesn't belong here. Well, it is very different, isn't it? So to the riff off the point one of you made about the spiral, there's several things about it that are unusual, but it absolutely is one of the first things you should know about this, if it's on the exam, I'd say it will be, um, is that it's the first museum building to use a spiral ramp as the main exhibit area or gallery, you could just say gallery area. Yeah, it's six stories of spirals Right. And then it opens up with a skylight. It's a, it, when you walk inside, more often people look at the building first, not and before they start even looking at the art, because the building is a work of art. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, now, what happened? How did it get built? That's the other part of the meaning because of how Frank Lloyd Wright's reputation was so powerful. He was so famous. He was the world's most famous architect. And if you want to, you can write it this way. You can say that his, well, you can say ego because he was an egotistical. If you ever know anything about Wright's life, he really, really egotistical, but he had the talent to go with it. He was so sure of himself that it would get built that he didn't even attend those hearings. And he just let the debate rage and then he quietly submitted, you know, the permits, the request, you know, we're not him, but his staff, you know, to get the building started. So then World War II hit. So it was delayed by the war and finally built after World War II. It opened in 1959. And this is one other important fact about me. It was the last building ever completed during rights of his designs, of course, <laughs> uh, during his lifetime. He lived just long enough to see it open and he died like two, a couple of weeks later. So he had the satisfaction of seeing that when he first proposed this design, the whole neighbor, well, not the whole neighbor, but m most of the people who spoke up were against it. If you know anything about that neighborhood now, it's the Park Avenue section, and it's obviously very well to do and extremely expensive. I know people that have, you know, known, I don't know anybody that lives there now, but I used to, and I certainly know people that have uh, family and, and in laws there and now say, oh, meet me in front of the Guggenheim or I, I live near the Guggenheim. So now they're proud. They're, they're so proud they brag about it. But, you know, one, no, two, two generations ago, those people hated this. OK, the last thing is the style. When it comes to architecture, you should know what style, if the building has style in all of them in our um, class, you know, seminars on architecture, you'll see, we'll have a specific style. So this is Frank Lloyd Wright's own word for his style, the last style, just like all artists, I said like painters, but also architects, they go through phases and they develop and evolve into new styles and maybe, you know, abandon an old one. So this is his last period, Wright's final uh, period stylistic. He, he called it organic, you know, the word organic, something that comes from nature. Well, when he first told the critics who didn't like it about that, they said, what are you talking about? How is this relating to anything alive? Okay, anybody ever taken a walk in a large park, whether it's a public park or a private one, doesn't matter, whatever city, and a walk across the grass after it rains and you step on a lot of these little things? You know what I'm talking about? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody's taken a walk in the rain. Yeah, what, what could you step on if you're walking through grass in a park right after rainstorm? <laughs> uh, snails are slow. Snails, perfect, thank you, yeah. That's what Wright said. So the last part of the meeting, I think it's it's almost satirical of him to do this, but he is right in one way. This does, he said, this is like a giant snail, which you see all over the park that you live across the street from is literally facing the park, right? So what you have here is the shell, right? And here's the body connecting between the shell and the head. 
the two ground is the gift shop and the uh, cafe. So that's how he, he explained that this was organic. You might think that's a stretch, but it worked. He was able to get both critics and the city government to you know approve of it. And now, like I said, people who live in that area have often said, in fact, if you ever watched, uh, I haven't, but I know friends who do, a series of sex in the city or sex and the city, I don't remember which it is. Uh, the characters often would say for you know a first date or just to meet a friend, meet me in front of the Guggenheim and you didn't have to explain what, where and how to get there. You, everyone knows this museum. It's, it's so famous. And now you see this technique used in hotels and, uh, you know, all kinds of public buildings, town halls, you know, uh, and other museums. But he invented this spiral technique uh, for this for, is the first time he used it. Actually, it was used in San Francisco on a building that's not open to the public, but that's you could go there, but you couldn't take a picture of the inside. Well, you can't anyway. I'll go ahead and tell you, you know where Union Square is. You, if you go to Union Square, and go to Maiden Lane, that is a little side street, it's well marked, it's only one block long, and walk to the middle of it, you'll see a building that will clearly be, it's got a plaque in front of it, is an early Frank Lloyd Wright building, and if you look in the windows, you can see, because the windows are pretty big, you'll see a spiral ramp there, and that building was opened in 1946, but see, he designed this one, you'll have to write this now, and you have the last part, about five years earlier, like I said, World War II started for America right then, right about then. So, so it was derailed by, you know, world events. But he had designed this building first. And then he, when he couldn't get the permits for it, he went to San Francisco. And, you know, everyone there knew who you know, all the planners, I mean, knew. And so they approved that building. It's like a one quarter scale version of this. And it's a gift shop. And it's- uh, It, it, it right used to be right next door to Gump's, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's, a, a, you know, have a fun day in San Francisco, go to one of the museums, you know, show me the evidence, you get 10 points for you know, attending an art museum, and then you could take uh, photos of the uh, exterior. I think you can find enough details on the outside to get 10 points, yeah. Yeah, anyway, so it's getting, well, no, it's only 408. I still didn't do the formal elements here. So let me wrap it up with that and then stick around with uh, any questions you have up until 430, because like I said, I have to move all the way across Anley Hall to meet a tech person who's gonna help me in, in my classroom at 408. Okay, let's summarize this, just shouldn't take very very long. Just the main elements of composition in architecture are very similar to say in a painting, drawing or sculpture, but there are some differences. Let's start with the most important element of composition for a building. And we're gonna see plenty in this semester and there'll be at least one, probably two architecture slides on both the midterm and the final. So this is an important concept to understand. And I'll go over it again next week with the illustrated lecture on all elements. But the element of space in a building, it's not a technique because it's real space. So here is the definition. You don't have to write this, but it might be helpful for you for the future architecture slides that you write about, uh, which is the architectural definition. That is what architects define space, uh, oh, sorry, architecture. The definition of architecture is two words, enclosed space, period. If you think about it, that covers everything from igloos and teepees all the way through, you know, the most, you know, like the Burj Minaj, whatever it's called, the tallest building in the world, or the Sears Tower in Chicago, which is still the tallest building in America. Oh, nice. I know the New Yorkers say the Freedom Towers. Yeah, so I'll say it again. Space, the real use of space, is an element of composition that you should always write about with any slide that you're describing or any work of art that's architecture. So how is the space divided here? Well, a couple of you already told us when you went inside. One large uh, gallery area which is made up of six story. This is all, you don't have to get the exact dimensions. Well, you can, if, if you're writing a paper, you should be able to look that up. But for the exam, I don't expect you to have, you know, the height exactly or any of that. But just say a six story spiral ramp is used for the largest area, which is the gallery. And at the top, there is a skylight. Or just say with a skylight at the top. So a six story spiral ramp used as the gallery or exhibit area with a skylight above. That's the largest space. And then you don't have to describe every space in here, but you would want to mention the two round rooms, one of which is a, <clears throat> a gift shop. I believe it's the lower one. I've been here like three times, but it's been a while. And then the, the uh, cafe, there's always some kind of cafe at every museum I've ever been to. So one of the two round rooms is they're the same size <clears throat> and they're at the far end. 
you know, right? I don't know, north or south, I can't remember. And then the rest of it is, is offices inside, of course, for the, the staff on the first two floors or on the first two levels. So that's how the space is divided in this building. <coughs> Okay, so that's one take uh, of the elements of composition. How about the color? Well, I think it's pretty accurate in this picture. It's a very light yellow, but yellow, any shade of it is warm. So these are, are warm. The colors on the walls here is kind of a pale, you can say pale or light yellow, but that qualifies as a warm color. Uh, oh, this is painted brown. You don't have to get that detail. The, the main color is, you know, but if you were to write a paper, you might want to mention. And also there's a warm color on the outer, the roof line of the, uh, second floor round. Well, let's just say that that is the uh, cafe. It is a cafe. I remember now because you have they had tables out here where you can eat. At least the last time I went there. Okay, and then what else about this? This building balance. Well, now this is a harder one to tell you. Uh, see, I mean, from this angle. So if you were to stand in front of it or take a, another look at it, I think you can tell once you you see what I'm getting at. This is the largest section clearly of the entire, I just said that as far as the space goes, but also <clears throat> for the balance, it's not balanced. This building is weighted or unbalanced, you can say it either way, towards the right. Because if you stood in front of it, where my arrow is, you'd be looking up at the largest section of it. And that's called uh, unbalanced or weighted. This building is unbalanced toward the right because this area is obviously only what four stories pretty obvious i think once you start looking at it at this photo even though it's easier when you're standing in front of it to see that so it's not balanced left to right or top to bottom uh, and then we have the rhythm oh boy it's the whole idea of a ramp right the rhythm is just repeated shapes all the way up this ramp okay uh and then also the two rooms are both the same shape they're round but what about textures are they real or simulated well, now that we have a close up here, you can, I wasn't actually going to do that until the last moment. See, that's metal and glass, and then the walls are the concrete, painted concrete. So there are three textures, all real. There's no simulated. Most buildings don't have simulated textures, they have real textures of whatever material. And you only need to describe like the three main ones. Some buildings have so many different textures, you know, if they're like a Victorian house or something. But, but on a modern or reasonably, this would be considered modern, you know, architecture, even though it's before most of you were born, I'm sure. Uh, you would just say that, that here the textures are all real smooth textures and then you need to, to, to say what they are and it's pretty obvious concrete glass and metal. So it has three real textures, all of which are smooth, and you would just list them like that. And that would cover that, that uh, element. Um, <clears throat> and I already told about space. So I think we're right up almost at 4.15, uh, which is when we will usually end these lectures. Yeah, so the timing is good, uh, but I do promise that since I don't have formal office hours, I stick around for several minutes if need be, uh, if, if you have questions. Um, about anything we just covered or anything relating to the class that you didn't already, uh, you know, get an answer to. And you can always email me, of course. And uh, also, now I'm not going to confirm every, I take way too long. I'll tell you this, all of those I'm going to log in over the weekend. Well, later this week, probably tomorrow or Friday, all of those uh, mini bios and, and check you off as, you know, being fully enrolled. But in, in reverse of that, so we don't eat up a lot of class time. I will probably on Wednesday of next week, uh, just uh, say, okay, there's X, Y, and Z people I didn't get this from yet. And I will send an email also to remind you in case that's, you know, something that you've, they're too busy, you forgot, you joined the class late or something. Um, <clears throat> again, the mini bio, if you didn't write it, is three things. And we'll end with the, this lecture with this, and then I'll stick around if there are any other questions. It is first, uh, three things. First, you write about the, your background in um, educational background uh, and your ex work experiences. That's the first thing. Second would be where have you lived or traveled outside the Bay Area? And third is what do you want to learn about art from this class? You know, that's within the scope from Renaissance to the 20th century. What do you want to learn about most in this class? Okay, that shouldn't take more than half a page if you didn't already do that. You should get to that. And if you can get to them by Friday, that would be good. All right, here we are, 4.15. Any questions from anybody? Yeah, because this is your chance to ask a live question. But of course, if you think one after of uh, a question you didn't,
have at this moment, you can always email me. Um, I usually get back within 24 hours. Hey, Mark, I have a question for you. Sure, please, yeah. Just overall, um, your two buckets, right? Meaning and formal analysis. Yes. The formal analysis is, I'm certain I'll get the rhythm of this as the class goes on, but formal analysis is basically you, composition. Persons, a person's summary of the, of the elements of composition, yes, whichever yes, elements are included. Exactly. Yes, it's a it. okay. Now, that's pretty straightforward. Meaning, um, the way you describe today is almost um, some of it was meaning, and a lot of it was just kind of a caught historical fact and story yes. context. Good okay. point you're raising. I can I can uh, keep it more you know focused. No, to the no, 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 no. That that's cool. I'm just saying it's it's um, meaning isn't just meaning like. Uh, uh, Picasso, you know, this is meant to be a, who knows what, a dramatic political statement. Um, you also yeah. filled in historical context. Sarah history. Gill talks about it in her book, but I'll, I'll summarize it. I didn't mean, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing because I think most students will find it's, it's helpful. It's called uh, context. You, you said it well. Historical context helps you understand a work of art. What period was this created and what event inspired it? Or what uh, philosophy the artists, you know, like the fact that Picasso was a communist, therefore anti-fascist, right? And that motivated him because of that incident in the Civil War. That's called context, the historic context. And then there's also what style the work of art is. That's part of the meaning always. If you can, I mean, almost every work of art has some kind of style that the artist was using. And then there's the artist's life. So it's really four subcategories of meaning, but I don't want to get that complex this early. So when you hear me, you, you're exactly right. I'll probably touch on each of those. You know? And then there is what you're calling the illustration method of meaning, which is exactly what you pointed out. And that's what I usually start with, not always. And that is the story or incident that it illustrates. It's called the illustration. So there's multiple ways to understand meaning, but on the exam, you don't have to deal with yep. all of that. Or in your papers, you can focus mostly on the artist's life and the illustration of that event, but it's helpful to have some information, at least in this class with the notes, about the context and the style of the work of art. But all of those apply to meaning and they can be used on either the exams you know, or the uh, papers. I hope that that's helpful. Yeah, that's what we're here for. So let's see, any other questions? from? Because that was a very helpful one because I hope that helped bring to everyone's mind because you notice it might be different than what's in the textbook. I'll go ahead and say this. You can get an A in this class by just using your notes during the exams as long as you took good notes. And if you miss one, you know, get them from the lectures or a fellow student, uh, the YouTube uh, videos. And, and just have that out next to you. Uh, and you don't need to have your books with you during the exam. When I say open book, it's it's implied you might want to have the book to look at the picture, but then it will be on the screen. <laughs> because the textbook doesn't have time. No textbook can go into the uh, relative more depth, relatively. But in your papers, you will want to go into, you know, more than one aspect of meaning. And of course, all nine elements. We'll talk about how to write the papers, like I said, in about two weeks. Next week, the focus is going to be on how to understand and recognize those nine elements. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, um, sure. are you going to, because today it seemed like you were helping us like pointing things out and what we should be writing, things yeah. like that. I, so, will, but, I won't do that every, but I'll try to do it as, as most uh, every uh, le lecture. I'll do it well uh, as much as time permits. Is that what you're asking? But I can't always do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I was just wondering, like, because it was quite helpful when you would point out, like, oh, you know, here's, like, formal analysis. Like, I'm going to talk about that now and things like that. Like, oh, I always transition. will do that. I give you uh, three heads up. I'll say this is must know, meaning if you weren't thinking of taking slides, I mean, notes on that slide, <laughs> you, you want to start taking notes. And I always say it's a must know. If I don't, just cue me if you're not clear but if it's on the syllabus you can be sure that you should be taking notes but i usually let's just say 80 or 90 percent of the time i'll start out and say this is the next must know but the more important thing is what you're referring to is the breaking down of the categories i really found this helpful when i was a student in art history i had all kinds of teachers i had some who bored the daylights out of all of us students and others who were so inspiring, I still remember what they said. And when I went to Italy or whatever country they, they, they were lecturing about, I would know more than some of the people that lived there about the history and the art of their country. So the point is that that is helpful. And I will always do that. I always tell you, okay, now the meaning first is almost always what I start with. And then I'll switch to formal. I will always give you that. 
prompt. Okay. Hope that Thank helps. You. All right. You're welcome. Anybody else? I have kind of a specific question. Sure. It's, okay. um, it's kind of far back, but for the Guernica one, um, maybe I just missed it, but was it a tapestry or a painting or a mural? Uh, oh, good question. No, it's I did say it was a painting, but I oh, think implied something else. So you don't have to know this if people who have already started, logged off that they're not going to miss something they need to know if it's on the exam. I'm not saying it will be. By the way. Uh, it's a painting which is on canvas which is so big that he had to roll it up and have a special transportation for it to take it from one country to another. He traveled all around the world with that painting. I don't mean to every country, but he made a globe, literally, there's an article about it in some magazine time that my father has had, I'm sorry, he passed away. The, 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 the fact is that he was trying to get people in each continent to be aware of this civil war and the crimes committed by the fascists. So it is on display now on the Wall Museum. So it's a painting on canvas, 20 feet long. I forget, something like 12 feet high. Maybe it's even 25 feet. It's 20 or more feet wide. Yeah, it's a painting on canvas. Yeah. And it's movable. Yeah. Some paintings, a fresco wouldn't be, right? Yeah. This goes in the wall, in the plaster. It's not a fresco or a tapestry. It's a, it's a painting on canvas. Okay. okay. Sure. So anybody other questions? Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we've uh, completed our task for today. I look forward to seeing you all. Uh, do do make sure you, you catch the lecture on Monday because that'll be much clearer for all of you uh, about all these nine elements because we didn't even get to all nine. I think we got to seven of them, but we will finish covering them all in more detail next week. That'll be the topic for the first uh, lecture on Monday. And then Wednesday, we'll be doing the slides of early Renaissance. So keep up with the reading. That's your only assignment. And I'll see you all next Monday. Okay. All right. All thank right. you. Well, thank you all for thank your, you. your, easy. your comments and your, your questions. You take care. All right. See you in a, uh, five days. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> hey, Mark. Yes. One more question. Just a, uh, sorry. Just a, um, uh, a quick comment. I'm going to try and uh, obviously make uh, all your classes. Um, I'm one of your adult learners, so I also um, have uh, professional responsibilities. And if on occasion I miss a class, uh, I know you, in your syllabus it said like, you know, um, something like less than four is okay. I don't expect to miss more than that. But if I do, I'll try and give you a heads up. And I just want you to know That's it's not appreciate. like I'm skipping a class. Sure. I actually have. And you can like, watch the videos, remember now, you know that, right, on YouTube uh, after the yeah. lecture by the Friday, by after 7 p.m. Actually, be safe, let's say, eight, because it takes a while for them to download. Okay. Or, yeah. that, sounds, that sounds cool. Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. Okay. Sign All right. Up, right. Unless there's a more urgent person. Okay. All right. Bye. Until next week.